Um, so, good morning, no, now good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for coming along to this session. Um, I'm Elaine Huber, I also work at the University of Sydney with Peter, um, and I'm going to um, take you on a bit of a journey through sort of a self-reflective um, uh, journey of mine. Um, I've worked as an educational developer for oh, around 16 years, and um, in the past uh, 12 years I've worked on three um, transformation projects and so what I'd like to do is tell you about each of those and um, you've heard a lot about the third one so I, I might skip through that one but um, I'll tell you about two others and then I'd like to reflect on <clears throat> what I've learned in that process so I don't need to spend any time on telling you about transformation I'm sure you've all been there and you've tried it you've um, been part of it um, we all know about the chaos that erupted with COVID and the complexities that that's brought into our transformation um, journeys. Um, but what I just wanted to touch on briefly is that this word transformation. And transformation can be um, quite small and quite simple and can be very personal, or it can be huge and large scale. And obviously that example that Peter was sharing there is definitely the latter category. Um, and I'm going to share three of the bigger categories, but I have obviously, and I'm sure you all have too, worked with a lot of people on that smaller scale transformation because really um, we're all on this innovation curve and it depends where you are on that curve as to, you know, the size of the transformation, the size of the change. Um, so I also will use the, a, a, a reflexive lens, if you like. Um, I'm sure we're all familiar and we all know about the importance of reflection, particularly with our students. Um, but I, um, I particularly like this quote. I mean, obviously, reflection's been around for quite some time. Um, uh, Marina Harvey wrote this one. Marina's um, a mentor of mine. and She's done a lot of work in reflection. But it's really about learning from what you do. And um, I'm going to use a 1990s, because this is the 30th anniversary of ALT, um, paper to structure my reflections. So um, Driscoll did work um, in the nursing field, actually, um, and just used these questions of, well, you know, what, what happened in the situation? Um, so what? You know, understanding the context. And then perhaps now what? Thinking forward about um, what we've learned from that. So I'm going to talk about three projects. Um, they're all at universities in Sydney, um, where I've worked. And um, the first one, I'll go into more detail in a moment about each of them, but um, they're, they're pretty much university-wide, or in the third case, at the business school, it's a faculty-wide transformation project. But as Peter mentioned, our, our faculty is um, like a small university. It's rather large. So um, I think one of the important things before I go into the detail of each of those projects is to think about what success looks like. And yesterday there was a great presentation by some colleagues from Liverpool University, I don't know if they're here, but they were talking about how they'd um, garnered perceptions from staff and students about what a successful VLE might, might look like. And um, I think it's really important before you start any transformations to think about how do we know it's, something's ch been transformed, if you like. And lots of these different projects that I've worked on have used different criteria, um, but I do think it's important to measure them. And I'm sure you could probably add to that list, and I invite you to if you're online, if you're at home, and you want to share other ideas in the um, Discord chat, please do. Um, but these are some of the ones that I've um, come across in my, uh, in my journeys. So um, before I go into the detail of the three projects, one last thing, um, challenges. We all know there are a multitude of challenges when we're working in this transformation space, in this change management space. And but for me, these are two of the biggest challenges that I've I come across and still do. And uh, we know that change takes time and that it's time consuming to take part in a transformation project of any size. Um, but um, how do we get buy-in from our academic colleagues who are already, um, you know, pretty time poor. They've got lots of things on going on. They're teaching, they're researching, they're doing their um, community outreach. How do we get them to add on to that to change their practice and to think about um, 
you know, uh, innovation in different ways. And then the second thing to me is not just our academic colleagues, but how do we bring other stakeholders on this journey with us? How do we um, ensure the success of the project? And this comes through from my, um, I did a PhD in evaluation of innovative projects. So, you know, for me, it's really important to um, get that stakeholder buy-in so that anything that you evaluate could then be implemented in a, in a much better way. So, you know, talking about, I'm talking about students, about industry, um, colleagues at the library, the IT departments, all of these people who have a stake in the success of a transformation project. So, a little bit onto each of the three projects. Um, the first one was at Macquarie Uni, and it was a very standard move between um, learning management systems, we call them LMS, but you call them VLE, I think, um, and we moved from Blackboard to Moodle, and our new Moodle instance was called iLearn. So we hired a big team of iMovers, because they were doing the lift and shift of you know, the administrative side, but it was, a, it was, it was a, a big team that was led from the Central Learning and Teaching Unit, um, we tried a self-determination theory approach where we really were um, aiming to uh, a bit of a Trojan horse. We tried, we're trying to lift the digital capacity and capability of our staff through this move between VLEs. Um, we utilized faculty champions um, uh, and we developed um, bespoke resources. We decided not to go with the standard Moodle resources, but we developed our own. We offered drop-in sessions to try and um, you know, speak to people's time availability so they could drop in whenever was suitable for them. Um, and the results of that project were we had 18 months um, to get ready and, you know, on day zero we, we switched over to Moodle and it was quite a seamless transition. been hard work for the 18 months to get everything ready, but it was pretty good. So what did I learn through that project? So that was back in 2011. Um, we started, and um, for me, uh, I led a big, a, a big section of the team in that project, um, and that value of teamwork and getting the right members on the team was, was critically important. Um, just this regularity of meetings, and everyone groans when you hear another meeting, but just really about updating um, people on progress. You, we, we had traffic light sort of system about how particular units of work were coming along. Um, and yeah, developing the resources for the different levels on that innovation curve. So, you know, there was a lot of people in the middle who just needed to know how to use Moodle and what it might, what the basics were. But then we also had the, you know, the people who were at the top of the innovation curve, who were the, the forward thinkers who already knew all the basics and wanted to try something new. So we developed resources at three different levels for the sort of different approaches. And we, we developed a, a suite of exemplars, which really worked well because, um, you know, that expression that you can't be it if you can't see it. Well, you know, this is very true in ed tech. You know, if you can show people what something looks like, it helps them, you know, visualize it and come along on that journey. And obviously communication, we had a faculty liaison role, like one person's role in the team was to be that touch point and keep answering all of their specific questions and making sure the communication channels were open. So um, a few more, fast forward a few more years and I moved to the University of Technology in Sydney and I was part of a very large transformation project there. The diagram is a little bit um, detailed, but basically each of those five arrows were sort of stages in the development or the transformation process. So it was about ensuring that students um, were able to quantify their learning goals or make sure our learning outcomes were aligned and, and well written in our, in our courses, in our curriculum, um, uh, ensuring that um, students had good access to content and knowledge and um, our content delivery methods were accessible. Um, it was about um, creating those authentic learning experience in being interactive and immersive. Um, obviously feedback was critical, making sure everybody was giving lots of um, opportunities for students to get feedback in the process of their learning and giving them an opportunity to, to reflect. So we called this sort of approach, if you like, university-wide approach, learning, learning dot futures, the dot was very important. Um, but um, really this was again led from the center um, of the university, from Central Learning and Teaching Unit, but we really sort of, um, offered staff 
lots of opportunities to understand these five pillars, if you like, or five ways of, of teaching and learning. And um, we spent a lot of time socialising. We didn't expect everybody to do everything all at once. Um, and, you know, in terms of measures of success for this university, it was very important to be, um, to get this student feedback, those quilt um, levels of satisfaction that Peter mentioned, that's a national uh, measure. Um, they score very high um, on those. Um, and international awards were very important for that particular university, and they did win a few. Um, so what did I learn through that process? Well, for me, it was very important um, to realize well, the importance of context. And um, so whilst we had that general approach, we allowed each of the faculties to apply that in their own specific way. So I actually worked with the Faculty of Science at that time um, and helped them develop um, processes that worked with their ways of working. And they felt um, spoken to because as scientists, they felt they were very different to other parts of the university, and they are, um, in terms of what they needed um, to change. Um, I found the Faculty of Science threw some money at it, which really helped. Um, the importance of working closely with ICT to have them on board with us to, to move things forward. Um, celebration of um, people doing good work and examples, again, um, was a, another success factor for me or important for me. And, and I also learned about bringing students on the journey through this project. So we didn't really, cons so it really was a, a, an approach to flipped learning and um, students didn't like it. They didn't like that back in 2014 we started this. They didn't like that they had to watch stuff and do stuff before they came to class. They didn't understand the value and our teachers didn't really get it either so they weren't telling them how important it was or what the value of, of doing it in this way was. So yeah, really important to bring students along and help them understand why you're making a change. So um, third and final project was um, the Connected Learning at Scale project, which you've heard a lot about from Peter, so I won't go into too much detail. As he mentioned, these three um, pretty basic um, underpinning pillars, if you like, that really um, you can then apply and adapt to different contexts. So we do have a dedicated team leading this project forward. Um, whilst we were we started this in 2019, we were obviously um, disrupted by the pandemic, but we found that it helped. It actually helped people start to think about changing and to start to think about new ways, particularly around principle one, about delivering content and how to interact more with the students. Um, and we took a strategic approach. So we started with all of our core units, our foundation units and our capstones that everybody had to do. Um, so we changed those first and then we, st we, we worked and we worked with them over 18 months and which we called a deep touch approach. We then, um, we, during the pandemic, we trialed a light touch, which was just, you know, changing one or two things for a lot of units. Um, and now we've settled into a sort of a medium touch where we work with staff over six months. So I won't go into any more detail on the project, but what did I learn from that? Um, you know, evaluation is really important. Uh, getting human ethics for capturing data so that you've got this evidence to show people um, that you've collected it rigorously and that this is um, what people are saying. Co-design is, you know, is the top thing for me. You know, getting all of those different voices, it takes longer, but you, you, do, you do get a lot more from it. Um, again, context matters. It's been throughout all of these three projects. You need, you need some basic foundations like our principles, but you need to be able to apply them to different contexts and different, give people the opportunities to see them in different ways. And to do that, we developed um, a website called the classdesignpatterns.com class with one S because connected learning at scale um, and in that we kind of we've come we've collected this you know huge amount of data and we have been able to distill the top I think we've got the top nine problems of teaching at scale on our website and then you can go into each of the problems and then you can look at different patterns so different solutions to that problem and then within each solution you can look at how it's been applied in different disciplines so in marketing or in finance and see how how you might be able to then adapt a pattern to your own context rather than saying this is what you need to do to fix your problem you know there are lots of ways to do that 
So they were some of the things that I've learned um, through that. And just to finish off, I would like to I'll skip that one. Um, tell you about I came across this just recently, and in terms of my reflective journey about what makes up a good team, and I've said this all the way through, the team is, is what makes a good project and a good transformation. And these are, you might, you might be familiar with this, actually there's a, there's a QR code if you want to read up more about it, but it's, um, it's about different roles that people play within, within a team. And I feel that I've actually played all of these roles throughout my career. Um, I started off very much in that bottom right-hand quadrant as a systems thinker, I was an engineer, I started out as an electrical engineer, so I'm really able to see a bigger picture, but also drill down into the micro as well, and sort of work across silos, and that's been really important, and you need someone who's able to do that on your team. I think the, the next thing for me would be the designer and maker. I was an educational developer for a really long time and a learning designer. So, you know, you need people on the team who kind of understands the power of design and the, the ability of what tools can do for us and who's able to sort of make those things happen. Um, and then I guess, you know, I feel I'm also a connector and a convener. Um, I think this is, you need somebody who's got good relationships and is able to sort of bring people into spaces and bring the right people together at the right time from different backgrounds and perhaps, you know, join the dots to make a, a bigger movement. And then finally, that you know, you definitely need a leader and a storyteller. And I think you've met our leader and storyteller this morning um, in our project. Peter is definitely the big ideas person who comes along with, you know, let's try this, let's try that. Um, and, um, you know, I'm learning about that and it's, it's about, you know, uh, sort of um, not just telling a great story but explaining why it's important and bringing people from different levels um, and also having the tenacity to, um, to see the work through to the end. All right, so my final slide is... Um, just a few final thoughts. Again, this goes back to that Driscoll paper that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, three important things around reflection. So reflection isn't always about change, changing. You might reflect that what you're doing is really good. And I think coming to conferences like this, you can see what other people are doing. You can benchmark yourselves. Um, you know, keep there's always good things that are happening and we try to tell in our transformation projects that we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, we're just going to pick the good things that work well and build on them. Um, think about your own practice, it can lead to innovation, doesn't always, um, and don't make too many changes at once because that can um, be very disruptive. So yeah, that's it from me, thank you. Do we have a mic for the audience, or do we need to repeat the question? Yeah, let's get a, a mic for the audience. So we've got um, some time for questions. So if there are questions from the audience, I'm happy to run around uh, talk show host style. And yeah, we got questions. OK. For, it could be for me or Peter. Could yeah, be I'm happy for to. either one. Yeah. So. <laughs> but you wouldn't want me going on those stairs. Okay, how are we doing? Oh, good, good, good. Go. All right. Do you three want to collaborate on your question or? That's complex. Dustin, you start and then we'll go. Thanks very much. Those are very interesting talks, uh, as always. The question I have is uh, this is very uh, progressive especially within the context of the UK. So what would you say to those, how do we upward manage? Because some of this may take good moves from the top, but sometimes it needs good moves from the bottom as well. So I'm not really clear what your question is. So it, it is, you need, so you need buy-in from the top and from the bottom, no? If I can interpret, I think he's asking how do you get leadership to recognize this is necessary and then give you the resources to actually do the thing. Yeah? But also sometimes the leaders in question may not have all the knowledge so that if they don't feel they have all the knowledge, they can't do this. And they might need a push from the bottom, if that makes sense. Upward management is what it's called, I think, in management speak. 
I still don't really understand the question. Look, I think that there's two parts to this. The, the leadership part is having the right rhetoric and narrative to talk to leaders about. Uh, we were very lucky. Um, we walked into an environment where we generate an enormous amount of revenue for the university, and that revenue potentially was at risk. So to talk to the leaders in that terms, we want you to invest X amount of money to protect X amount of money. And that kind of worked. But the more important part was how do we convince not just the leadership and, you know, convincing the dean wasn't too hard, but convincing the university was harder, but how do we convince our academics to get involved? And I think that's one of the biggest challenges. So that's the bottom up bit. Because if you take innovation normally, you could say, look, I could get 25% of my people doing stuff without a problem. And those 25% of people will keep innovating every time, every time, every time, give them more stuff, they'll do more and more and more. I'm going to get 25% at the top that will never innovate. I'm not going to move them no matter how much money, how much support, how much bribery we give them, they won't move. The real group of people we need to work with is the 50% of people in the middle. So a lot of those people in the middle are not going to innovate or not going to want to be transformed because they're, a bit, they're scared, because there's risk, um, there's precarity in higher education. We all know those things. And student feedback is one of the only measures that universities use to measure the quality of teaching. And at the heart of that, part of what Elaine's team does is make those people feel comfortable to do that. And it's because they're not on their own. They're working in a team of co-designers. They've got ed developers, they've got learning designers, they've got media people. They've got students all in that group with them. And what the school reassures them, so yeah, I have, I'll call myself one of the leaders. What, one of the, what the leaders reassure them is, you know what, it's going to take 18 months and we know that your student satisfaction scores are not going to bounce up six months later. It might take six, 12, 18 months. Your fail rates aren't going to come down immediately. But we give people the confidence to get involved in that and know that punishment is not the outcome of change. That actually support to change is far more important. We could probably do one more. Anne Marie, do you want to? Oh, oh. OK, I'll, I'll monopolise the microphone then. You, you can find Peter later. Um, I was really struck by the phrase transitional space, Peter, because it really resonated in terms of we don't own students. They pass through our institutions. And we forget this an awful lot. We, we believe, because we're stuck there all the time. We're static in time, and they're not. Um, and so I really, uh, I really appreciated the way you are building a way of learning that isn't, isn't what we do, I, I suppose, um, and, and really respects that transitional space that they pass through and they leave traces behind themselves in the form of those videos. So I just wondered whether that kind of thinking about, you know, it's a, it's a life transition as much as anything else, as much as a learning transition, had fed into any of the thinking. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I'll, the, the brief story I'll tell is our Vice Chancellor is uh, relatively new. He's been there about two years. Um, he always talked about uh, when we're in various buildings in the university that he remembers when he was studying at the, at the university in 1986, sitting in these rooms doing exams and how important that was to him. And like, it's almost like he'd never left the university. He didn't transition. And he was trying to find ways of associating himself. And it just wasn't landing. It was landing with staff but wasn't landing with the students. And so earlier this year, I bumped into him at a, at a um, leadership retreat, and I actually just said to him, OK, can you imagine, his name's Mark Scott, can you imagine, Mark, if you, the 18-year-old the Mark Scott sitting in that lecture theatre in 1986, can you imagine if someone like you, the Vice-Chancellor, had walked up to you and said, thanks for being here at the University of Sydney. Um, I hope you're going to enjoy the education that we've designed for you. Uh, it's going to be based in 1954. 
And he looked and he thought about that for a second and went, oh, that, I, I, I get that now. He said, what, and I think what he was trying to, what he really finally worked with him, worked, worked through, because he'd never been a vice chancellor before or worked in a university before. This is his first job in a university as vice chancellor. And what he started thinking was, what is the bit that he needed to take with him from his university experience? It wasn't sitting in McLaren Hall doing an exam. And it's not what, and then he started realizing like he's doing a redesign of the library and he, he, the whole plan changed. He took away what he thought students wanted and went and asked them. So that, that notion of transition is not just about the fact they pass through our space, but it's that bit that you said, what bit do they leave? Not, what they, not just what they leave at the institution, but what do they take with them? And then how that then becomes part of their life journey and defines their life journey. Uh, and I find it interesting how people sort of think through that. Uh, but the Vice Chancellor, at least, at least he listened, which I think is not common. <laughs> there's, a, there's a yes or no question here, so we can use some. Did you create a dedicated strand in the project to address the cultural change? In, I assume them in the, uh, the last project, but um, sure. no is the short answer. But yes, in terms of, um, <clears throat> so our team, our change team is made up of educational developers and learning technologists and learning designers. But our ed developers do pedagogical research, so they're academics as well. And they really um, did a lot of work around um, understanding the context and bringing together sort of the things that would help and help move people forward. So whilst, so it's kind of in their remit and they act a bit like project managers, they bring all the people, they, they, there's connectors um, in, that, in that quadrant diagram. So um, we didn't identify it as change management. We probably couldn't because we're in a business school and there would be people who say, oh, that's our area. Um, but yeah, we, we did it surreptitiously through our ed, ed developers, I would say. Thank you both so much. Thank you all for coming. That's it.